Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Nela Haldeman. I'm an assistant science editor for The Scientist, and I'll be moderating our discussion today. We have two exciting speakers lined up for you. We have Dr. Kim von Oetzel and Dr. Ryan Flanagan, who will discuss the cutting edge technologies that they incorporate to improve stem cell based therapies for various disorders, including cancer and infertility. As a quick note before we start, um, we like for our webinars to be as interactive as possible. So we encourage you to send us your questions or comments at any point during the webinar. And our speakers will address these during the Q&A session after the presentations. Um, if you have a question that you would like to ask, you can click on the Q&A tab that you can see on the right side of your screen and type your query into the question box. Um, we are recording today's webinar and we will be archiving that on the website of The Scientist. Um, you will receive a link um, in your email, uh, in your inbox within a couple of days, um, but you will not be able to download today's presentation slides. Before we start, I would like to take the opportunity to thank our webinar sponsors for today. Um, that is 10x Genomics, Biolegend, Syntego, and Acro Biosystems. All of our sponsors have provided us with some helpful resources related to today's webinar, and we posted these in our handout section, which you can see also on the right side of your screen. You can access and download these documents at any time during the webinar. And with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Kim von Atzel is a research assistant professor in the Division of Hematology and Medical Oncology, and she's a faculty member of the Center for Regenerative Medicine at Boston University School of Medicine. Dr. Van Oetzel obtained her PhD in molecular and stem cell medicine from the University of Leuven in Belgium, and she joined the lab of George Murphy at Boston University for her postdoctoral training. She studies fetal liver, sorry, fetal liver hematopoietic stem cells, that's a mouthful, um, to gain insights into what defines this population's remarkable engraftment potential. Dr. Van Oetzel recently discovered a molecular signature that predicts hematopoietic stem cell engraftment potential, and she's leveraging this information to improve stem cell transfer success rates for patients who are suffering from hematological disorders. Before we start, I want to just make sure that your slides are up and running. Yeah, that looks great on my end. So with that, the stage is yours. All right, Nila, thanks for the introduction. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, All right. All right. So, hi, I'm uh, Kim Van Otzel. I'm a research assistant professor at Boston University, and I'm excited to share with you our work on the profiling of human fetal liver hematopoietic stem cells to reveal the detailed molecular signature of engraftment potential. Now, let me start by explaining uh, to you why we think hematopoietic stem cells are so interesting that we want to profile them in great detail. So hematopoietic stem cells, or HSCs, uh, reside at the top of the hematopoietic hierarchy and can give rise to all mature blood cell types while maintaining a pool of themselves through self-renewing divisions. This means that when they get transplanted into a host with a defective or wiped out uh, blood system, they can reconstitute their entire blood system. And it's this remarkable capacity that has led to their widespread use uh, in the clinic as a therapy for a multitude of disorders. Now, in the clinic, uh, it's standard procedure to enrich for CD34 positive cells from cord blood, bone marrow, or mobilized peripheral blood, because we know that this marker enriches for hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, which are the cells here uh, on top of this hierarchy. However, CD34 is a very broad marker, which means that we're enriching for really a pool of cells, and only a very small percentage of these cells represent true functional hematopoietic stem cells. Um, unfortunately, and unlike the mouse situation, we don't really have a marker combination that can isolate one single hematopoietic stem cell. Uh, we do have a way to distinguish true hematopoietic stem cells from their downstream progenitors, and this is based on their functional definition, because we know that true hematopoietic stem cells are capable of long-term multi-lineage engraftment capacity um, upon transplantation into a host, unlike their downstream progenitors. Now, it's this long-term multilineage engraftment capacity that makes these cells so valuable and has led to them being uh, intensively studied because people want to know how to retain this engraftment capacity upon ex vivo culture of hematopoietic stem cells or even induce it when trying to make hematopoietic stem cells from pluripotent stem cell sources. 
In terms of applications, for instance, for sickle cell patients, uh, gene editing of their own hematopoietic stem cells uh, is a promising new approach that is currently being explored in clinical and preclinical trials as uh, a potential curative uh, treatment. However, the ex vivo culture and manipulation associated are necessary for the success of such treatments uh, poses challenges in terms of retention of engraftment potential, as well as expansion of hematopoietic stem cells. Now to understand or to find out how to better retain or even enhance this engraftment potential, we decided to uh, profile fetal liver hematopoietic stem cells because these cells display superior engraftment potential compared to their postnatal hematopoietic stem cell counterparts and at the same time represent a stage of active uh, hematopoietic stem cell expansion. So basically, this means that we're looking at a very unique developmental cell stage where we have this population of hematopoietic stem cells really at the peak of their functionality. And we also made sure to uh, profile these cells at a resolution that far exceeds any previous attempts. Now, of course, you don't have to believe me. Uh, I'll show you hopefully in the next slides. Um, so what we did is we profiled human fetal liver derived HSCs or hematopoietic stem cells at single cell resolution where we looked at the transcriptome and the cell surface marker expression in individual cells and then combined this with transplantation experiments in immunocompromised mice to couple these expression profiles with functional engraftment. So the technique we use here is called SideSeq and it's basically very similar to your typical uh, droplet based single cell RNA sequencing procedure but now with the added advantage that you can add these uh, oligo-labeled antibodies up front so that at the end of this procedure, you get both levels of information, meaning your mRNA readouts and your cell surface marker information based on the antibody-derived tags. Um, so what we did is we took a human fetal liver and divided this in several uh, different fractions. But of course, our main fraction of interest is here, the CD34 positive uh, population for which we isolated live cells into uh, a CD34 bulk population. And this is because this corresponds to what is typically used in the clinic. And then from this fraction, we further enriched for uh, GPI-80, which is a marker tightly linked to engraftment potential to really focus on hematopoietic stem cells. Transplantation experiments using these same sorted fractions that we profiled uh, by SiteSeq revealed superior engraftment uh, potential for the GPI-80 population, thereby confirming the enrichment for bona fide, truly functional hematopoietic stem cells. And now just to provide a little more context for this assay, so what we're doing here is we're transplanting these human cells into immunocompromised NSG mice that are receptive for these human cells. And then after 16 weeks, we're uh, looking to quantify the human CD45 positive cells, and that's because CD45 is a pan-hematopoietic marker. And we know that only true hematopoietic stem cells are capable of giving rise to human blood cells that express this marker after this amount of time. So really, it's a quantification of truly functional hematopoietic stem cells. So what this means is that by profiling more than 7,000 of these GPI-80 positive cells, we really achieved unprecedented resolution of the engraftable HSC compartment in the fetal liver. Now, if we start by looking at the combined analysis of all four of these fractions here on the left, we find that it nicely recapitulates uh, the hematopoietic landscape of the fetal liver at this stage uh, in development, representing all the expected cell lineages and blood cell types. Of course, we're mostly interested in the CD34 positive uh, hematopoietic stem and progenitor fraction that is in this uh, circle right here. So what we did is we um, clustered all these, we clustered this population separately and then maintaining these cluster designations, we again pulled this fraction apart in the corresponding fractions being CD34 positive bulk and GPI-80 so that we could nicely track um, cluster uh, proportions over functional HSC enrichment or GPI-80 enrichment. And this is summarized in the stack bar plot below where we can find that there's, there's the most prominent uh, increase in size is uh, evident for this red cluster zero here, um, indicating that the transcriptional signature associated with this uh, population is the most likely representation of uh, engraftable fetal liver hematopoietic stem cells. Now, to further dissect uh, this transcriptional signature, what we did is we uh, looked for differentially expressed genes between this red cluster zero and the other clusters within the GPI-80 positive sample. And we found several interesting genes enriched in our cluster zero. So here, for instance, we found evidence for um, a negative AHR or a, a real hydrocarbon receptor feedback loop. 
And we and others in the past have shown that HR innovation leads to enhanced endothelial to hematopoietic transition and HSPC uh, expansion during in vitro differentiation from pluripotent stem cells. Moreover, we also know that SR1, which is an HR inhibitor, expands CD34 positive cells in cord blood. So basically, this confirms a role for um, a negative HR feedback loop in uh, HSC biology. Something else that we found really interesting is here this um, gene family, the inhibitor of DNA binding or ID gene family, where we find several members, ID1, 2, and 3, um, and they show this really nice localized expression pattern all the way at the edge of cluster zero. So what we know from cord blood is that a, res a reduction in expression of these family members leads to loss of quiescence and in vivo repopulating capacity. And in other systems, ID1 has been implicated in controlling the balance between dividing and resting neural stem cells by promoting quiescence. Um, and this is not the only, so it's tempting to speculate that these genes are doing something very similar in the hematopoietic system. And this is not the only uh, indication of the importance of this balance between resting and dividing cells or the importance of quiescence in this population. Because when we did um, gene enrichment uh, analysis using the scenic package, we found several regulons here on the left um, that are responsible for driving a cluster specific uh, gene expression program. And if we look at cluster zero here on the left, we find um, again, family, KLF, uh, KLF family members and NFE2L2 driving a cluster zero specific uh, gene expression program. Now the latter one is was interesting to us because NFE2L2 or NRF, uh, in addition to being a master regulator of the antioxidant response pathway, is also known to balance quiescence and self renewal in mouse hematopoietic stem cells. So again, an indication that this balance is really important for engraftable uh, hematopoietic stem cells. And the last one that I'll uh, draw your attention to is here uh, our second most enriched gene in cluster zero. It's uh, lamin A, which encodes the nuclear lamina protein lamin AC. And we know it's expressed in postnatal hematopoietic stem cells, so that's interesting, but its expression also declines with age. Moreover, uh, expression of this gene is higher in long-term hematopoietic stem cells than short-term hematopoietic stem cells, at least in the mouse. So this all suggests a link between lamin A expression and HSC functionality. Um, in line with this, when we compared the expression, we found um, higher expression of lamin A in our fetal liver uh, CD34 positive cells as compared to uh, publicly available data sets representing bone marrow and cord blood uh, CD34 positive cells. And when we then looked more specifically in the hematopoietic stem cell fraction, so more uh, focused, uh, which we have profiled in great detail in our work, we again found more prominent expression of lamin A as compared to uh, in fetal liver HSEs as compared to hematopoietic stem cells that we identified in a bone marrow data set. Um, now, this wasn't just true for lemon A, but a similar pattern was observed for several other genes enriched in this cluster zero, indicating that the signature that we identified in our work specifically represents hematopoietic stem cells at a stage where they display the superior engraftment potential. So this now forms the basis for further biological exploration, which we hope to do together with others in the field, which is why uh, as soon as we could, we try to share our data sets and our code with everybody. And now they're available through this publication here on the left. And we also uh, made um, an interactive browser where people can play with the data and look at their favorite genes. So this has both the mRNA and the ADP information. Now, up to this point, I've only discussed the transcriptional profile, but of course, thanks to our antibody derived tags, we also have a uh, cell surface marker uh, information. And here, for instance, so we found that this ADT level information really nicely complements the, the mRNA information. So uh, here I'm showing a few relevant hematopoietic stem cell uh, markers. And if we look at these first three here, which are often used in combination to enrich for hematopoietic stem cells, we notice an expression pattern based on the ADT information that isn't necessarily apparent based on the mRNA information, indicating regions of co-expression of these markers, as you would expect. Um, something else we can do is now integrate this mRNA and ADT data and then stratify uh, HSC enrichment strategies. So here on the right, I'm showing on the x-axis, these are all our uh, oligo-labeled antibodies that we took along in our side seek screen. And then on the y-axis, we're representing the number of cells <coughs> or the percentage of cells representing cluster zero. And what is evident is that uh, CD201 or EPCR 
could be a good marker for this cluster zero. And again, this is not something that was readily uh, apparent based on the mRNA data, uh, but it was evident based on the ADT information. Um, and then when we further computationally explored this, we saw that here in the right bottom, upon progressive enrichment for CD201, this coincided with progressive enrichment for cluster zero. So basically our computational analysis here predicted that CD201 or EPCR could be a good marker to enrich for engraftable fetal liver hematopoietic stem cells. Then of course we wanted to test this or validate this functionally. So here we're looking at the readout on the left of transplantation experiments where we transplanted um, CD201 enriched cells uh, in parallel to GPI-80 enriched cells. And we found superior engraftment potential for these fractions as compared to their depleted fractions. Moreover, these data also indicated that um, CD201 uh, enriched cells were even more potent and more capable uh, of long-term engraftment than their GPI-80 counterparts. And the same is shown here uh, in the middle in a longitudinal fashion. And on the right, we just validated or verified the multilineage reconstitution potential of both sorted fractions. So what we're seeing here is basically that as predicted by our computational analysis, we were now also able to functionally validate and confirm that CD201 or EPCR uh, is a marker that can specifically enrich for highly functional hematopoietic stem cells. So why does this matter, you might ask? Uh, we're not the first one describing EPCR as a marker for hematopoietic stem cells. However, our work does highlight that it's a really great marker to uh, enrich for these most functional uh, true hematopoietic stem cells. And this is valuable information uh, to improve some of these transplantation regimens. For instance, here I'm showing again <coughs> the example for uh, this um, gene editing approach for sickle cell disease. And there's other diseases in the pipeline that can potentially be uh, cured using a certain a similar methodology. But these uh, therapies are wildly uh, expensive, so much so that it's it's still a question mark whether they will reach and will be available for the people who will actually need them. Just a small percentage of people might actually be uh, able to pay for these treatments because they're so expensive. And a big cost associated with this kind of treatments is here in the gene editing part where the reagents for the gene editing need to be added to the cells. And this is just very expensive because I told you that CD34 positive cells are isolated, but this is kind of a mixed bag of cells. And then we need to add a lot of reagents to this whole pool of cells, hoping that it reaches the hematopoietic stem cells in there. And that's just <clears throat> not a super efficient process and very costly. So if we had a way to really first enrich for the true functional hematopoietic stem cells and then uh, apply the reagents to this much reduced pool of cells, this would save money for sure. And also would ensure that we are targeting exactly the cells that we want to target, which are these um, long-term engraftable uh, stem cells. So this would uh, cut the cost of these procedures, make them more efficient, and in that sense, make them safer and more widely available to uh, patients suffering from hematopoietic disorders. All right, so uh, with this slide, I kind of want to highlight an application of a multimodal data set like ours. So here we were exploring whether we could use the ADT or the antibody derived tag information as if it were flow data and gate out populations of interest in a process that we term in silico sorting. Um, so that's what we did. And we compared three well-defined uh, HSC enrichment signatures in this way. And then we projected those cells on a common uh, into a common UMAP space. And we found considerable transcriptomic overlap between these three signatures. And the same is shown on the right by looking at the differentially expressed genes. You can see that there's a lot of overlap between these three signatures and shared genes. And uh, at the bottom, I'm showing you the top enriched, top 25 enriched genes for one signature. And again, you find a lot of overlap between the signatures in terms of genes enriched and also how they are ranked. So this uh, suggests to us that the transcriptomic signature corresponding to engraftment potential that we identified in this work based on GPI-80 enrichment actually represents a generalizable engraftment signature for fetal liver hematopoietic stem cells. Now, there's many more uh, applications with a multimodal data set like this. Uh, however, something that we are well aware of is that this data represents one uh, fetal liver sample, which could, be, <coughs> which could be seen as a limitation of our study. So to counter that, we made sure 
to validate the site-seek expression patterns in five additional fetal liver samples using an orthogonal uh, methodology. So to do so, we designed a multi-parameter spectral flow cytometry panel um, to really characterize the HSPC compartment. And this comprises several of the most relevant um, markers that we took along for our site-seek experiment and some additional markers. So what I'm showing here are the cells that we're using. So left bottom is are the CD34 positive fetal liver cells of five uh, additional fetal livers that we're profiling here. And then you can see that we also took peripheral blood mononuclear cells as a control or basically to provide context for the more mature uh, cell types or cell lineages. So what is nice about this way of looking at things is that we can present the data in a very similar fashion as the high dimensional transcriptional data that we've been working with before. So we can present them in this UMAP uh, visu visualization and it really helps us to compare and, and look at the data. And it's extra nice because now for all these markers in our panel, which were 24 or something, uh, we can now overlay the expression of these markers onto this common UMAP and it's very easy to compare expression patterns, look at co-expression. So we really like this way of looking at our data uh, to validate some of our site seek uh, readouts. So you can see that I've divided this up in lineage markers and progenitor markers. So these lineage markers typically are used as negative selection markers when working with hematopoietic stem cells because they mark the more mature uh, cell types, which you typically don't want. But here uh, we find that it provides some nice context in terms of lineage potential and um, perhaps biases if you're comparing different samples. So instead of dumping them all in one you know, dump channel just to get rid of them, we wanted to see them separately. And then on top, we have the progenitor markers. And you can see that this represents a range of stringencies in terms of uh, HSC enrichment uh, potential, let's say. And if we focus on the upper row here, I've got them here again. Uh, we see, for instance, that CD34, the marker used in clinic, is a pretty broad marker marking uh, hematopoietic stem cells and progenitors, so many, many cells. And then if you look at the next two markers, again, often used in combination to enrich for uh, hematopoietic stem cells, you can see that on the right of this UMAP, there's a region of uh, co-expression of these markers as expected, and also as seen in our site-seq data, so really validating our site-seq readout. When we then look at GPI-80, which is a marker that we use to enrich for our super, super zoomed in uh, HSC population, we again see that there's an overlap in this region at the right with the other markers, again, uh, in line with our site seq data. But the most interesting marker to me at least was CD201 or EPCR again. I just showed you how we uh, functionally validated this marker to really enrich for the most functional hematopoietic stem cells. And it was just so nice and validating to see it's very localized in the thumb of this UMAP, so really at the apex of, of this hematopoietic hierarchy. So if we're looking for true hematopoietic stem cells, it becomes pretty clear where we want to be looking. So we really like this visualization and, and the ease of this uh, panel working with it. And we think it might be useful for other people looking at hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, that's why we had another, uh, we, we wrote everything up and detailed the uh, creation of this panel in a separate publication. So anybody who's interested can go look there. All right, so in summary, uh, by profiling a highly enriched and potent HSC fraction, both at the transcriptional and cell surface marker level, we provide an in-depth characterization of engraftment potential in a unique and developmentally relevant HSC source, such as the fetal liver. So um, I showed you that at the transcriptional level, level, we were able to establish this detailed engraftment signature, very specific to this, <coughs> these engraftable fetal liver uh, hematopoietic stem cells. And then by looking at the cell surface level by means of our antibody-derived tags, we were able to computationally predict EPCR as a marker to enrich for our special cluster zero, which we then also validated at the functional level uh, to really further enrich for engraftable fetal liver hematopoietic stem cells. When we further integrated mRNA and ADT data, um, <coughs> we noticed that this engraftment signature identified in our work actually represents a generalizable signature for engraftable fetal liver hematopoietic stem cells. And then we also made sure to validate these expression patterns in uh, multiple additional fetal liver samples using our multi-panel spectral uh, flow cytometry panel. And then again, we made sure to have all this data av available to anyone who wants it. We have our interactive browser that people can look at. All our flow data and code is shared at the flow repository. 
and all of these links are available through our original publication and then the flow panel itself is in another publication so um I hope I highlighted the fact that this is a nice and valuable resource for people to work with, but what are we now going to do with this uh, information in the near future? So um, in our next follow-up experiments, we hope to take what we learned from the fetal liver and this really unique developmental stage, and then translate that to a postnatal setting so that we can uh, identify conditions that will maintain or even enhance functionality of hematopoietic stem cells uh, in ex vivo culture, so prior to transplantation, in really um, clinically relevant HSC sources such as cord blood and bone marrow. So the way we will do this is by, um, well, we, we now have this list of pathways that are really important for fetal liver hematopoietic stem cells. So the most interesting pathways we will then modulate in postnatal CD34 positive cells, and in that way identify uh, which have the capacity to augment the functionality of hematopoietic stem cells ex vivo. And something else that we can do now that we have this really detailed uh, engraftment signature is use it to help guide the generation of engraftable hematopoietic stem cells from pluripotent stem cells. So this would be such an important regenerative medicine goal if we could make hematopoietic stem cells from pluripotent stem cells, because that would mean that we can make these cells from virtually anyone. So one thing that is a problem currently is that not everybody finds a great match uh, in terms of uh, HSC transplantation uh, donors. And this would kind of solve that because everybody could have a spoonful of blood made into iPS cells or induced pluripotent stem cells and then made into their own hematopoietic stem cells. It would solve rejection of these cells. It would solve graft versus host disease. So it would really be pretty amazing. And we're well on our way as a field to make these cells. However, some things are still challenging. So we can make perfectly fine hematopoietic progenitors in vitro from pluripotent stem cells and several mature uh, blood cell lineages. However, true long-term uh, engraftment has not been convincingly shown yet. And that's one of the main characteristics of true hematopoietic stem cells. So we think that using our signature will get us a little bit further in this quest to find or to generate hematopoietic stem cells and graftable hematopoietic stem cells from pluripotent stem cells. And another benefit of looking in the fetal liver is that we think it's a, a developmentally more relevant comparator than adult bone marrow that people sometimes profile. So in terms of a roadmap, I think this is closer to where we're starting from using pluripotent stem cells. So I'm really excited about those applications as well. Um, and then lastly, I'll just thank everybody who needs to be thanked. So this was a great collaboration between the Murphy Lab and the Ballas Lab at the Reagan Institute with contributions from several people across the campus. And uh, I appreciate all their work on this. And that's it. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Van Etzel. That was really interesting data. Um, as a reminder to our audience, if you have any questions, um, do feel free to submit them at any point during our webinar. And you can do so by um, entering them in the Q&A tab on the right side of your screen. And then we will get uh, we will try to get to as many um, of those as we can after our next speaker. And that speaker is Dr. Ryan Flanagan. Dr. Flanagan is a surgeon scientist and uh, assistant professor at the University of British Columbia. And he also maintains an adjunct clinical assistant professorship at Weill Cornell Medicine. Flanagan completed his medical training at the University of Calgary and his urologic uh, residency at the University of British Columbia before starting a postdoctoral fellowship in male reproduction and sexual medicine at Weill Cornell Medicine. He leads Regenerate, a research program that studies the mechanism of defective sperm production in patients who lack the ability to make sperm and aims to develop regenerative technologies to induce spermatogenesis. To achieve these goals, Dr. Flanagan's research group combines single cell genomic approaches with human-induced pluripotent stem cells and 3D bioprinting technologies. And so before we get started, I also want to make sure that your slides are up and running, Dr. Flanagan. Great. Thanks very much for the introduction there. Just going to uh, okay. presenter mode. Yeah, that looks great on my end. Perfect. 
Okay, excellent. Uh, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, <clears throat> I'll be kind of uh, trying to frame everything kind of from a clinical context and then go through a little bit of the literature of what others have done and, and then some of the experiments uh, that we have going on kind of in our, our fairly new lab. Uh, so infertility is a big problem around the world. About 15% of couples are infertile and male factors contribute to about half of these cases. Now, the most severe form of male infertility, uh, we call azospermia, and essentially that's a scenario where we do not have any detectable sperm in the semen. Uh, it impacts about 15% of infertile couples, and this translates to about 1% of the, the general population. Um, now, when we don't see any sperm in the semen, this can be either due to a blockage, uh, which we call obstructive azospermia, or it can be due to a sperm production problem. <clears throat> Now, usually obstructions are a little bit more uh, easier to uh, kind of get around and treat. We can either reconstruct something uh, microsurgically, or we can get sperm and use IVF, um, ICSI, which is the process of taking sperm and injecting it into an egg, watching for fertilization, embryo development, and then transferring it back into uh, the female uterus. Um, however, on the other side of things, um, non-obstructive azospermia, where there's a defect in sperm production, uh, this is a lot more challenging to manage. Now, we don't have a really great understanding of the etiology for these patients and, and uh, all, all things considered, we only have a real explanation about 15 to 20% of these uh, patients. So uh, chromosomal abnormalities such as uh, Kleinfelter syndrome, which is uh, 47XXY is the most classic, although there's variations within that. Um, and uh, mosaicisms, that accounts for probably about seven or eight percent. And then there can be uh, micro deletions on the Y chromosome, which contains a lot of the really critical genes for spermatogenesis. And that accounts for another six to eight uh, percent, revving at that 15 percent. Um, there has also been another, other studies, um, some recent publications, in fact, finding some single gene mutations that can contribute. But all things considered, it's likely a multifactorial disease likely has a genetic basis, but uh, there's still a lot to understand. Uh, that's kind of the <clears throat> intrinsic um, population that have sperm uh, production defects. The other group uh, can be acquired and, and this can include cancer survivors. So uh, amongst cancer survivor populations, in adults that are diagnosed with a cancer, they may receive any form of therapy, whether that's uh, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, biologics, and uh, all these uh, patients usually are counseled for fertility preservation. On the male side, it's a lot uh, easier in terms of uh, generating an ejaculate uh, to cryopreserve. Um, however, some, some of these patients are missed or the uh, disease may progress so quickly that there may not be an opportunity and they can end up into this category of non-obstructive azospermia. Um, the other population are pediatric cancer survivors. So uh, these individuals, that are diagnosed with a cancer before uh, puberty hits, um, they've not had an opportunity to make sperm uh, because the onset of spermatogenesis happens um, throughout puberty and, and beyond. So if they have to undergo chemotherapy, radiation therapy, et cetera, the only option available to them is to have a testicular biopsy and then crowd preserve that tissue. In that testicular biopsy, these individuals should have either gonocytes or uh, spermatogonial stem cells, and they be, can be cryopreserved um, for some future technology that's developed uh, to be able to regenerate that um, spermatogonial stem cell into a full-grown sperm. Now, the current treatments available for the patients that um, do not have any sperm either accessible or cryopreserved is... Um, <clears throat> a microsurgical uh, testicular sperm extraction. We call it a micro -tessie. So this is uh, a process where uh, we do a, a surgical procedure. It takes two to three hours. Uh, we go into the testicle. Uh, we make an equatorial incision like the figure kind of demonstrates here. And we open the testicle kind of like a coconut. On the inside, we're looking at all these seminiferous tubules, which are the base functional units for spermatogenesis. And we're looking for heterogeneity within this. And so if you look at um, number C here, um, there's, you know, one kind of illustrated tubule that looks a little bit healthier, a little bit more plump than the other ones. And these are the, the types of regions that we try to target under microscopic 
uh, magnification during the surgery. All comers, we can uh, retrieve sperm about half of the time. And this translates to a live birth rate of about 10 to 25% when we pair this uh, retrieved sperm with IVF ICSI. So there's a clear need that we have a huge gap in treatment options for these patients and uh, regenerative treatment strategies uh, would certainly be really helpful. Now, <clears throat> there are certainly some important considerations based on the different populations that we need to try to create a regenerative therapy for. So if it's for this uh, population of congenital NOA where we think there's a chromosomal or genetic abnormality, our assumption is that there probably is some abnormality to either the germ cells or the somatic cells. So we may have to overcome some functional deficit, uh, even if the technology for creating spermatogenesis is, is in place uh, in the lab or with, with uh, an ex vivo uh, technology. Now, if we're trying to regenerate spermatogenesis for an acquired form of NOA, we're making the assumption that genetically, these are probably normal uh, germ cells and somatic cells to start with. They probably were on a path to produce normal sperm, but if they underwent some treatment strategies like chemotherapy, radiation therapy, um, those cells could be injured or damaged. Um, <clears throat> or if in the pediatric population, we may be harvesting these cells um, at a, a stage that they're immature and not um, fully capable for uh, spermatogenesis. So those are kind of the two different big picture uh, patient populations um, to consider and, and create technologies for. And there's also a few considerations when we're thinking about creating a therapeutic uh, approach that are really non-negotiable. So it obviously wouldn't be acceptable to reintroduce any potential for malignant cells in a cancer survivor. Um, we, we certainly don't want any xenocontamination um, if we're using certain reagents, uh, cells or, or um, uh, scaffolds, et cetera. Uh, genetic modification uh, to germ cells is uh, um, of high ethical uh, contention and, and certainly not something that um, is on the, the horizon as being acceptable. Uh, is there epigenetic changes uh, just because we can create a sperm if we arrive at that technology? Are there off-target changes uh, that may be of a functional consequence uh, to the future offspring that, that we just aren't capturing? So that's a, another safety concern. And um, for these um, individuals that do have defects in sperm production, by creating a technology to circumvent um, that process, are there some additional considerations that we just currently aren't aware of by, by kind of cir circumventing uh, you know, natural reproductive biology? So these are some questions that uh, we certainly don't have the answers to all these things, but uh, certainly need to be on our minds as we're working in this field. Now, there's a lot of different strategies or approaches that um, the field can uh, move towards in creating a regenerative strategy. Uh, certainly, we can harvest the testicular cells um, from a patient. We can either maintain it as a tissue and then perform something such as an organ culture or organic typic cultures. We can do autologous grafting after you know a cancer survivor has received treatment, for example. Um, this process was actually successfully completed in macaque monkeys uh, by a, a group in Pittsburgh and published in science in the last 18 months or so. Uh, you can perform xenografting, um, uh, again, with the whole goal of supporting the tissue to produce sperm. And then if you can recover sperm, you can do IVF ICSI, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning. The other uh, kind of uh, approach would be if you uh, receive these biopsies and then you dissolve the tissue into single cell suspensions, uh, you can do 2D culture systems. You can transplant the spermatogonal stem cells back into the testicle, which has been shown to be technically feasible in, in an animal model and try to recover sperm in either of these different approaches with in vitro techniques or with transplantation. Again, ultimately going to the same um, pairing with IVF ICSI. So um, our lab is, is kind of been more positioned to um, uh, work on trying to develop technology associated with in vitro spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis, which is the process of, of germ cell maturation after 
uh, they go through mitosis and meiosis one and two. Um, and we think there's a few potential benefits of this technology versus the other ones that I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, one, we don't have any risk of contaminating uh, any patients with cancer cells because we're not reintroducing back uh, cells to the body. Uh, we can maintain a xenofree approach in some of the reagents and culture medias and, and um, <clears throat> scaffolding, et cetera, that we're using. And we have the potential to um, overcome functional deficits in cells uh, using a precision medicine uh, approach. Now, of course, there are certainly some challenges that go along with this. Um, recreation of spermatogenesis is, is really complex. So if you look at the figure here, um, this circle kind of depicts a seminiferous tubule. Uh, we typically have peritubular myoid cells creating uh, some of the basement membrane along with the Sertoli cells. And then we have sur spermatogonial stem cells at the basement membrane, and they progress through all the different stages of spermatogenesis before they arrive at haploid uh, spermatozoa uh, that undergo all the morphologic changes from around cell to uh, flagellated uh, sperm. So uh, recreating this process uh, is complex. There's a lot of <clears throat> highly coordinated uh, temporal and spatial gene expression and cell signaling to coordinate it, metabolic requirements, et cetera. Um, some of the other challenges, like I mentioned, that's a, a more of a safety consideration is what about epigenetic changes and off-target uh, impacts. Um, <clears throat> some of the things that are you know, positive and suggested that this technology is within reach is it has been performed successfully in animal models, in mouse models, uh, et cetera. So um, conceivably the, the ability to do this in, in humans is also um, feasible and, and uh, within reach. Um, with the right science and technologies. Uh, so, so far, there have been a lot of groups working on this around the world and a lot of different approaches uh, taken to date. Um, so the big picture concept here is that we would take a testis biopsy, we'd isolate the somatogonal stem cells, we'd have to expand these in culture, and then we'd be looking to differentiate the somatogonal stem cells, uh, undergo meiosis one and two, and then finally sp spermiogenesis, which again is the morphologic changes. And it's really in these um, phases of development that a lot of technological development um, is, is still needed and a lot of work remains uh, to see this successfully, efficiently, and safely. Now, when we're looking at uh, the in vitro somatogenesis um, approaches, there's a bunch of different ways uh, that, that we can approach it. So uh, there's been some success with the 2D culturing systems. It can either be a model layer introducing uh, specific reagents at specific time points, uh, much like a lot of the HIPSC work. Uh, some groups have used feeder cells, uh, whether they're uh, somatic testicular cells that naturally uh, help support this, or uh, sometimes other cells like vero cells uh, have been used um, to successfully induce function. And then there's all the 3D culturing techniques, uh, 3D organoids, there's been some work organotypic uh, 3D scaffolds, and then finally 3D bioprinting. Uh, there's also been a lot of variability in terms of what people have used to try to help support this process. Everything from base medias, vitamins, hormones, growth factors, uh, introduced at different concentrations at different time points. Uh, as you can see, the number of variables to manipulate um, becomes exceedingly large very quickly in, in creating a coordinated event that requires uh, different things at different time points. Um, uh, in the interest of time, we'll just kind of discuss a couple interesting papers that have been published. Um, this was from uh, approximately 2017 or 2018 in a group from France. And essentially um, they use an organotypic type of culture. So they, they harvested testicular uh, tissue, uh, which was composed of the seminiferous tubules uh, from individuals that were undergoing gender affirming surgery. So these were biologic male individuals that were on hormone therapies for a couple of years prior to removing the testicular uh, tissue. Um, then what they did is they created these Kytosin hydrogel bioreactors and stuffed these tubules into those bioreactors with um, the media listed here. And they changed the media every couple of days. And um, what they found is that uh, their starting tissue um, this is just um, kind of the, the gross appearance of the tubules. And then when they performed IHC for somatogonial uh, markers and for Sertoli cells, what they found is that there were somatogonial stem cells 
but all the additional stages of surrounded genesis had regressed uh, back to kind of an immature state of um, uh, just the somatic cells and the somatic animal stem cells. And this has been kind of corroborated with some uh, studies out of the Utah group doing uh, single cell sequencing involving tissue like this. And, and um, that's typically the, the appearance that it's fairly similar to a prepubertal testicular state with the addition of these hormones. Now there can be some heterogeneity, uh, which is just one thing to keep in mind uh, throughout the testicle. Now they um, evaluated the tissue at multiple different time points. Uh, day 25, they saw some spermatids. Day 34, perhaps uh, some additional spermatids. And then finally by day 55, uh, they, they isolated uh, a full spermatozoa. So uh, that's uh, one of, of two uh, groups that have published on um, successfully arriving at a spermatozoa. Of course, this is very inefficient, um, but it certainly holds promise that um, uh, we are getting closer uh, from a, a scientific community in, in generating some of these technologies um, as we go along here. So what do we learn from these studies? Well, either using normal uh, genetic uh, starting tissue or immature starting tissue, uh, there certainly holds to be some promise. Um, and in vitro spermogenesis uh, requires cell-to-cell -cell interactions. That seems to be the most uh, reproducible um, types of technologies when it maintains that uh, largely with the organotypic uh, type of uh, uh, organ cultures. And um, some of the growth factor signaling and cells uh, to cell signaling factors uh, likely are very important. Um, and then there's a lot of unknown variables um, just because there's so much variability from study to study that shows fairly similar results to know exactly which growth factors and, and media conditions are, are really essential. So um, if we wanna move into the space of these individuals that have non-obstructive vasospermia that uh, um, within the human body, they fail to produce sperm, uh, we first have to understand what some of the mechanisms of dysfunction are within the testis and within the cells of these individuals. Then we have to overcome some of those somatic cell abnormalities. And the third thing that I think is important is uh, actually determine if there is a regenerative potential of the somatogonial stem cells that we can harvest from these uh, non-obstructive azoospermic patients. So um, some of the work that we've been uh, looking into is um, trying to characterize the cellular dysfunction um, within these NOA cohorts. So uh, what we did here is we batched uh, normal controls along with uh, two uh, testis biopsies showing different um, degrees of spermatogenic arrest. So in our normal control, uh, we have a variety of our expected somatic cells and then our spermatogonial stem cells going through uh, the differentiation to spermatozoa on this um, uh, arc that kind of looks like a Nike swoosh in our UMAPs. And if we have our, we look at our uh, hypospermatogenesis group, this just means that <clears throat> um, this NOA patient had very, very, very inefficient uh, spermatogenesis. So most of the stages of germ cells are there, but very, very rare sperm were actually produced. And then in this final one, Sertoli cell only or SEO, uh, this only included somatic cells and uh, this tissue didn't really have any uh, germ cells or somatogonial stem cells. Um, so just a different histopathologic uh, subtype. And what we found uh, when we're comparing uh, these two NOA conditions to normal is that there are an increased number of T cells and granulocytes in the NOA samples, but not the normals. We also found that there's a higher proportion of Leydig and myoid cells, as well as those uh, expressing immature cell markers in NOA compared to normal. We know that um, um, uh, immune cells and Leydig cells have a lot of co-interactions. And that's something that we're currently working on is trying to understand that co-regulation. And if that is one of the underlying pathogenesis, at least in uh, these patients that we've been evaluating. The next thing that we wanted to look at was, um, is there actual germ cell dysfunction? And when we compare the hypospermatogenesis patient um, compared to the normal control. So what we did is we isolated all the germ cells in, um, from the UMAPs in the single cell sequencing uh, we use the, the 10X platform for this. And <clears throat> what we did is we aligned the 
pseudo time curves in PCA space. And uh, we basically matched the, the different cell states so that we could compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges, so to speak, meaning that we can compare spermatogonial stem cells from the NOA to the normals, uh, spermatocytes from the NOA to the normals, et cetera. Then what we did is we performed differential gene expression and we tried to understand where the differences are. So if you look at these two curves, uh, the red is the NOA hypospermatogenesis group and the purple is normal. Um, where these curves uh, deviate represents that the cell expression uh, during these phases <clears throat> differs compared to when the lines are close together. So when we looked at this, we found that this was largely the case of the round and elongating spermatids, which are the later stages of spermatogenesis. So we thought, let's look a little bit earlier. Um, before they start to deviate, what were some of the abnormalities in germ cell uh, differential expression between the normal and the controls uh, to try to understand what is prompting these um, uh, curves and, and cell types to differ. And when we look at it, uh, the early and late spermatocytes, we found that the ATM signaling uh, was significantly downregulated in the NOA group. Um, and uh, looking into literature, uh, this downregulation uh, often results in myotic dysfunction and spermatogenic rest apoptotic elimination makes sense in an inefficient hypospermatogenesis patient. Um, autophagy is also um, downregulated in the NOA group. Uh, which we know is a, a critical process uh, for normal spermatogenic function. About 75% of germ cells going through spermatogenesis um, ultimately are apoptotic, um, uh, autophage, and, and removed um, in order to allow room and resources for the uh, most uh, viable cells to proceed forward and, and create sperm. Uh, the other thing that we found was that there um, was a, a decrease in glycerol degradation and other studies have previously shown that excess glycerol has had a significant anti spermatogenic effect. Um, when we look closer at this, we found that glycerol regulation is thought to be mediated from Sertoli cells. So we want to see if perhaps some of the somatic cell dysfunction was perhaps regulating or impacting the dysfunction in these germ cells. Uh, so we, we performed a dissimilarity uh, analysis uh, between our normal and our our NOA um, samples and compared the somatic cells. And what we found is that the, the Sertoli and the myoid cells were quite abnormal. And um, when we look at some of the recent uh, single cell sequencing papers, uh, they're actually uh, differently, um, yeah, differently abnormal compared to the abnormalities found in, in the Zhao 2020 paper, for example. In their paper, they found that the um, Sertoli cells had increased oxidative phosphorylation, suggesting that they were more of an immature state where ours demonstrated a decrease in oxidative phosphorylation relative to the normal controls, uh, suggesting that they in fact were not immature, but yet still very different. Uh, so the, the rule in uh, non-obstructive basis of spermio, what appears to be emerging is that heterogeneity seems to be the rule and that uh, different types of uh, somatic cell dysfunction uh, is variable from patient to patient and, and um, study to study. Um, this is uh, just a, a review of the Zhao paper that was published in 2020, which was uh, quite well done and interesting. And what they did is they uh, compared the single cell sequencing data from three developmental stages, infancy, puberty, and adults, and compared them to three different subclasses of this non-obstructive azospermia. Uh, they looked at the Y chromosome microdeletions that I had mentioned earlier, Felter syndrome, and then those idiopathic uh, cases, which make up about 80%. And when they looked at it, again, they found a significant number of Leydig and peritubular myoid cells, and they found that the Sertoli cells were quite abnormal when they performed the um, um, uh, dissimilarity analysis amongst the somatic cells. So when they tried to map them out relative to the different developmental states, they found that stage C of the Sertoli cells were thought to be normal and mature. And then stages A and B uh, were thought to be more immature, uh, comparable to the prepubertal and pubertal um, normal cells. And if you look at the idiopathics, Kleinfelters and the Y microdeletion uh, Sertoli cells, most of those cells were in these immature states. Um, which was consistent when they performed some of the pathway analyses that showed um, abnormalities in the wind signaling. 
So interestingly, what they did is they introduced some small molecules to inhibit wind signaling. And what they're actually able to show is that they're able to push these cells uh, more into the stage C group into what we think is more the mature group. Um, so this is you know, a perfect example of a precision medicine approach using some of the uh, single cell genomic uh, sequencing data, um, intervening uh, and then reevaluating for gain in function that could potentially be used in a pipeline uh, for regenerative treatment strategy for uh, this type of patient group. Um, so the final question is, you know, do these spermatogonial stem cells have the capacity to regenerate? Um, we're identifying that some of these somatic cells within the testicle have um, dysfunction and are likely contributing to impaired spermatogenesis. Um, but what about the spermatogonial stem cells, which are the base unit of germ cell that uh, has to go on to replenish itself and to differentiate eventually arriving at uh, sperm. So um, we started a, a, a small experiment here that we're just currently increasing the replicates for. But our question was, um, if we take somatic cells and germ cells and we create these 3D organoids um, for both a healthy patient as well as an NOA patient, and then if we um, cross the condition, so we take healthy somatic cells with the uh, spermatogonial stem cells from NOA patients and vice versa. Is there any change in spermatogenic function when we uh, continue to culture these 3D organoids? So what we did is we created these organoids uh, and cultured them for approximately 10 days. Um, this is what our normal control organoids look like um, histologically. Uh, SOX9 is a Sertoli cell marker. Uh, ACTA2 is the myoid marker. INSL3 is a lytic cell marker. So we had our main key somatic cells present. And then after culturing, SYCP3 is a, a marker of uh, meiosis and spermatocytes, which is a mid stage of spermatogenesis. And we find that um, uh, as early as day 12, uh, we were seeing both uh, RNA expression data as well as um, immunofluorescent data suggesting that this is progressing as we would expect it to. When we look at the gene expression with qPCR, um, some of the um, spermatogonial uh, markers uh, upregulated compared to day zero, some of the spermatocyte markers also upregulated, as well as some of the postmeiotic cell, which is the later stages of uh, spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis, also significantly upregulated to um, uh, day zero uh, before the organoids formed. So suggesting that the process of spermatogenesis is progressing along the expected course. Now, when we uh, added the NOA um, samples, um, if you look here, the, the purple, again, the gene expression here um, are the spermatogenic markers of different stages of spermatogenesis and the y-axis is full change. Um, the purple group is the healthy normal controls the blue group is the NOA um, um, somatic and germ cells. The green group is using healthy germ cells and NOA somatic cells. And then the orange group was using healthy somatic cells and NOA germ cells. So what we found was that um, when we introduced the healthy somatic cells with the NOA germ cells, it actually showed comparable upregulation of gene expression uh, similar to that in the normal group. Uh, where we had the NOA somatic cells in both these conditions, there did not appear to be as much of an increase in gene expression across the 12 days of culturing. Um, there has been uh, some other groups that have looked at um, the, the uh, potential for regenerating sperm from uh, these patients with uh, either normal um, uh, testicular tissue uh, called obstructive azospermia here or from the NOA groups. And what they did is they isolated the germ cells and performed differential plating, um, which is a uh, technique to try to isolate germ cells from somatic cells. And then they cultured them for seven to 10 days. And what they found was they compared these two different culture conditions, either a control culture condition um, or with the addition of stem cell factor and retinoic acid. And again, they looked at uh, these markers for spermatocytes as well as postmeiotic spermatids. And they found when you're using, starting with normal testis tissue, obstructive azospermia, uh, so normal sperm production at baseline, um, there, there was a slight increase in the enriched 
um, media conditions. However, um, they were quite comparable. Uh, if you looked at the NOA group uh, that had an intrinsic defect in sperm production, uh, there's really very little uh, increase in expression of these markers unless there is the addition of these factors such as retinoic acid and stem cell factor, suggesting that um, you know, these cells uh, have additional requirements beyond what um, normal starting tissue requires. Um, what they also compared is uh, after the, the culturing, uh, how efficient was arrival at uh, haploid cell, which is the postmyotic cells. And um, in these uh, NOA groups, um, the addition of the, the enriched cell media uh, suggested a greater proportion of the cells arrived at this haploid state, suggesting just how important uh, cell culture conditions are and uh, that there is in fact a regenerative potential um, from, from other labs as well of these germ cells derived from patients with uh, non-obstructive vasospermia. Um, they then went on to uh, take these uh, haploid uh, round spermatids and inject them into mouse oocytes and found that there's actually a successful fertilization and uh, blast development in uh, a small proportion of them. Now, um, with all this information, what is the recipe for uh, developing this in vitro spermatogenesis technology and trying to overcome these NOA deficits? Uh, this is something that we've been proposing, um, again, using a personalized uh, kind of medicine approach and, and precision medicine approach by identifying uh, what the cellular um, uh, deficits are in each of these patients as it is fairly heterogeneous. Um, and then uh, selecting cells from the testis biopsies to culture and expand uh, both the somatic cells and the germ cells, and then performing something like 3D bioprinting where you can encourage these cell to cell interactions and in recreating the somatic cell niche um, is likely necessary. And then um, using the correct uh, culturing conditions once you've created this uh, 3D cytoarchitecture so that we can arrive at germ cell differentiation. Um, and this may require um, you know, further experimentation with growth factors, small molecules, uh, media conditions, creating bioreactors, and uh, um, different variables associated with the, the um, 3D uh, cytoarchitecture crea creation. Uh, once we get to that point, we need to evaluate how well we did. Um, so uh, utilizing some assays or, or pipelines to try to have an efficient way of assessing degree of spermatogenesis uh, likely will require some additional work. Um, and if we can get there and show that there is safety data uh, and arrive at sperm production, then hopefully the end goal is to be able to inject that sperm into the egg and um, with the process of IVF ICSI and uh, be able to introduce this as a uh, regenerative strategy. So um, the, the last um, area that we'll talk about is um, this concept of perhaps using 3D bioprinting as a platform uh, to recreate the uh, 3D cytoarchitecture, um, perhaps more effectively than either 3D organoids or some of the other um, culture approaches that have been previously used. So um, some of the potential advantages is that we can recreate that cell, cell architecture perhaps a little bit better and create tubular structures uh, and really encourage these cell-to-cell -cell interactions. So um, we published earlier this year our um, first report of uh, deriving a um, uh, NOA patient-derived testicular biopsy where we expanded the cells in culture and then perform 3D bioprinting. So uh, what we did is we uh, got the testicular biopsy, we dissociated the cells, um, we performed that differential plating that I mentioned in the other paper earlier, uh, where we had the somatic and germ cell fractions. We expanded these, we validated that the cells that we thought we had, uh, in fact, we had. So we had our Sertoli cells, our myoid cells. Interestingly, some of the mature markers of lytic cells didn't show up in our 2D uh, cultures for expansion but later on in our three-dimensional structures did suggest that they're present. And we also had CD34 uh, positive cells. Um, and then our germ cells, uh, some of the various markers for these, uh, CD90, GFR alpha one, SSEA4, uh, GPR125 and STRA8. Uh, that's more of a slight differentiating marker for somatogonia. 
were all present and we had the absence of Sertoli markers such as SOX9 and ACTA2, uh, the myoid markers. So we, the germ cells appear to be germ cells and SMAC cells appear to be somatic cells. Uh, we then um, used uh, an aspect um, systems um, 3D bioprinter and printed uh, these core shell uh, constructs uh, using a coaxial needle. Um, we first assessed uh, our viability and we found that we had really good viability. Uh, fortunately, uh, there's very few dead cells. And then as a comparator arm, uh, we created 3D organoids um, <clears throat> uh, using a system um, that has been uh, previously described and uh, uh, use these for comparison. So we treated the organoids and the 3D bioprinted fibers with the same culture conditions um, for the same period of time to enable these comparisons. So what we found was that, again, this is gene expression, full change difference uh, compared to day zero. Uh, the, the blue uh, bars represent the organoids and the red bars represent the 3D bioprints. We find that these early somatic gonial markers um, and differentiating somatic gonial markers uh, upregulated more so in the 3D bioprints compared to the organoids. When we look at the meiotic markers and the uh, postmeiotic markers, they appear to be fairly comparable between the two. Uh, when we looked at the histology, uh, we were able to create these core shells where we have the cells uh, in, in this um, um, tubular-like uh, construct. This is obviously sectioned in the middle of it. Um, interestingly, uh, our biolink that we we're using didn't really facilitate a lot of cell attachment as the, the morphologies are fairly rounded here. And we also had these um, uh, secondary lumens that were forming presumably from some of the Sertoli cells uh, that are used to creating uh, lumens within uh, developing tissue. Uh, when we look at, again, some of these markers, uh, again, we're able to see some rare SYCP3 uh, protein ice, um, uh, markings in, in presumed to be somatocytes. Uh, and then we had the INSL3 positive cells, which were the Leydig cells, um, which we think probably matured in the presence of the other somatic cells uh, in the 3D cytoarchitecture, which was an interesting finding. Um, and similar findings were also found from the organoids. So uh, just to summarize, um, from the clinical context, there is a significant need for in vitro spermatogenesis as a regenerative therapy uh, for both the cancer survivor population, as well as those individuals with uh, intrinsic or congenital sperm production defects. Um, there's a lot of heterogeneity from patient to patient in terms of cellular dysfunction and pathogenesis. Uh, so I think a personalized medicine framework and a precision medicine framework is likely necessary to overcome some of these abnormalities moving forward. Uh, fortunately, this technology of in vitro somatogenesis has been successful in other non-human mammals. So I think that leads promise to its ability to be developed in humans. And um, uh, there's a lot around the world working on um, these problems and uh, taking different approaches. Uh, but I think uh, some of the 3D approaches, uh, which facilitates cell-cell interactions uh, and signaling uh, is likely to be probably some of the front runners in eventually arriving at this technology. Um, there's a lot of development in the bioengineering uh, world in terms of developing technologies that uh, could be applied uh, to problems such as this and, and uh, really help uh, move the field forward. Uh, with that, I just wanna acknowledge everybody that has um, uh, contributed to these projects from my lab as well as my collaborators and uh, sources of funding. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Flanagan. Um, our audience has already submitted several questions, so I would suggest that we just jump right into our Q&A. Um, and the first question um, is for you and actually comes from Dr. Van Axel. Um, if you could maybe comment on the maturation levels of the, the sperm cells that you, uh, that you showed before. Do you see that in vitro differentiated cells reach all the necessary maturation endpoints as you see in vivo? And are, they, are there any functional assays that you can use to, to test that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for most of the studies, including the work that we've done, um, most of them do not show the full extent of maturation. Um, and uh, so most of us have arrived at these intermediary cells um, that are partway through the process. So 
Uh, generally, they'll go from spermatogonial stem cells to differentiating spermatogonia through meiosis one and two, uh, which are categorized as spermatocytes. That's where most of us appear to be getting gene expression as well as um, uh, cell markers with, you know, immunofluorescence or flow cytometry. And then um, occasionally postmeiotic um, brown spermatids. But there's only two groups um, that have shown some data to suggest that they could arrive at um, either elongating spermatids or full spermatozoa uh, in vitro, um, which is kind of the process of spermogenesis going from the, the uh, round spermatid to those cell types where there's just a lot of morphologic changes and uh, DNA repackaging within uh, the, the nucleus. Um, so in terms of the next steps of assays to validate those results. And um, once you hopefully create that technology is um, largely some of the um, cell markers uh, to be used in terms of uh, really defining the, the cell types that are being derived. And then some of the functional assays um, that have been proposed in, in the past is either injection into oocytes to see if there is fertilization, if you can isolate these um, elongating spermatids or spermatozoa. And, uh, and then single cell sequencing to confirm that there was in fact um, meiotic recombination of the uh, chromosomes that, um, you know, the genetic content is different in those uh, cells compared to the somatic or germline cells uh, of the donor. Um, Beyond that, to confirm fertilization of, of the oocyte with the sperm, again, single cell uh, DNA sequencing, just showing that there is a combination of both um, maternal and paternal uh, genetic material would probably be the ultimate um, functional assays prior to, to moving forward to, um, you know, more, more uh, early clinical trial applications. Thank you. Um, and have you tried whether WENT inhibition in your in vitro system um, has any effect on, on spermatogenesis, since it seemed beneficial for the maturation of somatic cells based on um, some of the single cell RNA-seq data that you showed? Yeah, it's a, a really interesting question. Um, we, haven't, um, we haven't done that in our cell population so far, um, mainly just because our um, our single cell data seemed to be a little bit different and um, our Sertoli cells didn't appear to be as immature as uh, that one group uh, from the, the Zhao 2020 uh, publication. Um, however, it's certainly something that um, I'm paying attention to. We have another cohort of um, uh, five to 10 um, single cell samples uh, of these, from these patients that we'll be characterizing. And if they do show similar things, that will be something that'll be really interesting to uh, either create organoids or 3D prints with um, the addition of the small molecules like that. Great, uh, thanks. Uh, Dr. Van Atzel, a question, a question for you. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how SiteSeq works and, and how many antibody-derived tags or proteins you can analyze in parallel to the transcriptome? Um, so SiteSeq works basically by, it's, it's, it's a very simple process where in, on top of your typical uh, RNA sequencing, uh, you have these antibodies that have an oligo uh, label attached to them. So you just add them to the cells. And then for each single cell, you'll have uh, your mRNA readout at the end and through sequencing, but also because the, um, because of the oligo labels that attach through these antibodies to your cells, you can also through sequencing, have a readout of the cell surface marker expression of the different antibodies that you include. Now, in terms of how many uh, of those markers you can include, so at the time that I performed these experiments, I think there were some panels under investigation from uh, the provider itself, maybe up to 200. Um, I'm not sure where the field is right now. Maybe you can do more at this stage. We didn't go up uh, that high. Uh, I think we're we uh, included roughly 20 markers. So does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, and do you find any genes that are expressed at the mRNA level, level, but that are not translated yet in fetal hematopoietic stem cells? 
Um, so that is always a possibility, right? So there's um, overall, we find a pretty good correlation between the two levels. But the reason why we uh, like this multimodal way of looking at the cells is because there isn't a perfect correlation. And for some markers, um, this correlation is really bad. And one of the reasons why there might be a non-correlation is uh, the reason you just mentioned. But there, there are several others. There's like bursts of expression that you have to take into account. There's dropout associated with um, the mRNA part, but that's kind of solved, or it's it's better for the uh, the ADT compartment. So there's there's it's hard to really pinpoint for each scenario what the reason is, but that's one of them. And it's very interesting because, for instance, our um, so we selected our super super zoomed in hematopoietic stem cell pool based on GPI eighty because at that point that was the most convincing marker in the field. So this was um, enrichment based on uh, sorting right with a, with an antibody. But then in terms of mRNA readouts, so the, the correlating transcript would be VNN2 or VANN. And we found very, very bad expression of VANN throughout our samples, even in the sample that we had enriched with its protein marker. So it's a really interesting technique that captures all these differences. But to really pinpoint why there's a discrepancy between some markers, I think we would need uh, additional experiments. Right, right. And I guess some of those might might also point you in a direction of, of markers or, or proteins that regulate uh, quiescence, quiescence versus differentiation. Yes, yes. The nice thing is that you capture all these different levels, so you can start digging <laughs> when you find right. something interesting. Yeah. Um, do you think that you could uh, you would be able to further refine that um, refined um, stem cell population that you mentioned by adding other types of um, omic data or, or spatial data such as MRFish or SeqFish? Um, potentially, um, yes. So in terms of refining, like further purifying uh, or further enriching for these functional HSCs, um, we're already talking about a very small population here, but I think you can further uh, enrich for those. And then if we're talking about spatial transcriptomic technologies, that's actually very interesting because we now have this really, really super um, in-depth characterization of the cell intrinsic factors that play a role in engraftment potential in fetal liver hematopoietic stem cells. But we're also really interested in the cell extrinsic factors, because if you think about the fetal liver being the super um, remarkable developmental time point where hematopoietic stem cells basically are educated to become, to really unleash all their functional uh, potential, there must be factors in the niche that are secreted or uh, taken up by the cells that make this happen. And that's the next level that we want to look at. So we're planning uh, in collaboration with Dr. Dries here uh, at Boston University, uh, who's an expert in spatial transcriptomics. Um, we're planning to look at the spatial organization of a human fetal liver and really um, identify all the cell extrinsic factors, because we already have a nice list that we can use for our pathway modulations. But if we would know which factors are actually present right there in the niche and which cells are interacting with each other and, and communicating that would really refine this even further. Right, thank you. Um, uh, and then because you mentioned um, the size of your uh, cell population, your, your true stem cell population being quite small, um, there was a question about um, how many cells you actually need to repopulate an entire blood cell line. <laughs> well, in theory, all you need is one, right? Um, but then I think um, how many cells? I don't really have a perfect answer practically how that would work. Um, so you, you, the baseline is... The more, want, the better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's exactly what I was saying. The, the, the more functional HSCs you have in your pool, the better. And if we have a marker that can at least give us an idea of which um, entire CD34 positive population, how many of the functional... Uh, stem cells we can expect in there. We can just improve the efficiency uh, greatly of all these procedures. So, yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Flanagan, a question for you. Um, and it also relates to something that Dr. Van Etzel mentioned about, about trying to look at extrinsic factors. Based on, on your organoid data and, and the rescue that you showed by um, by mixing wild type and um, NOA germ cells, do you think that um, those NOA germ cells are missing some extrinsic use to generate sperm in patients? Um, yeah, I, I think that's, um, you know, a really sweet point. I think, 
there may be some intrinsic abnormalities to the germ cells from NOA patients, but certainly it appears that there is a strong story for the supporting somatic cells. So I, I and combined with some of the functional organoid data that, that I presented, I think that a lot of the extrinsic cell signaling um, factors and, and that supportive niche um, is likely, at, at least for the patients that have been um, evaluated so far, uh, I, I think it seems to be one of the major players, which makes me more optimistic about the ability to create uh, regenerative treatment strategies for, for this population, uh, because the somatic cells are a lot easier to overcome abnormalities. You know, it may be um, the simple addition of growth factors in these culture systems. Um, it could be manipulating that cell in isolation before combining like the, the wind signaling blocker. Um, so I, I do think that's likely some prime uh, candidates. And uh, I think that the dysfunction of those somatic cells in the niche are likely um, contributing to the dysfunction in, in the germ cells responsible for the somatogenic process. So, yes. Right. Um, and, and let's say in the future, um, 3D bioprinting method that you, that you talked about here can be used in the clinic. In that case, would somatic cells be used to support the healthy maturation of, of germ cells from NOA patients? And um, would that pose any epigenetic or ethical uh, concerns? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think, um, yeah, there's there's two different strategies that you could use there. One, you know, is perhaps creating a, a commercial cell lines that, uh, you know, have a lot of quality control, that there's no contaminating cells, et cetera, and perhaps introducing those. Uh, but like you said, um, there's a lot of um, communication from those cells could be impacting epigenetic changes. Uh, small uh, RNAs like microRNAs, pyRNAs are are really critical in uh, testicular development and somatogenic processes. Um, you know, could any of those things be impacting um, off-target uh, effects uh, beyond you know facilitating uh, germ cell differentiation? So I think that's that's something that maybe um, a little bit on the more risky side compared to using the patient's own cells all the way through and just trying to overcome some of the functional abnormalities and deficits uh, through either cell-based therapy, uh, treating those cell types before introducing them, or simply with the addition of uh, growth factors, small molecules, et cetera. Um, I, I, I suppose you could also look at you know gene editing uh, if there were specific uh, genes that were abnormal from uh, whole genome or whole exome sequencing in a patient and, and you found where those uh, genes were being expressed within the, um, uh, the somatic cells, if they were within the somatic cells, then perhaps you could overcome that and hopefully that would overcome the functional deficit and then recombine them in, in a 3D architecture. So I, I think there's a, a few different ways and pathways forward and they all kind of have different um, pros and cons, but I, I do think combining cells from other patients is, is probably uh, would require the most uh, safety data beyond you know specific gene editing, of course. Thank you. Um, and there was a question about um, the increases in T cells and granulocytes that you saw in NOA samples, and if, if there is some indication that there might be an immune system component to this disease? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, what we know about um, kind of from a epidemiologic standpoint is that uh, these patients uh, that are infertile and particularly the ones that have sperm production uh, abnormalities have a higher risk of medical comorbidities and premature mortality. So there is certainly something that is driving both the impairment in spermatogenesis as well as uh, the overall uh, lower health, let's call it, compared to normal controls. And there are certainly some theories. One is an immunologic uh, standpoint. The other is um, defects in gene editing mechanisms and gene repair mechanisms. Um, 
that can just lead to more instability, higher risk of, of cancers, et cetera. And, those, uh, and that perhaps is one of the key findings that um, it's hard to nail down any one particular gene that is underlying all this. Uh, what we're finding from some of the recent um, whole genome and whole exome sequencing studies is that there's uh, a number of different genes that are being found at low incidence rates, but certainly are very plausible to be contributing. So um, that, um, that could be an underlying mechanism. The, the immune uh, cells that are present, um, the question is, is that just resident uh, cells responding to, uh, you know, whether it's an infection or uh, uh, some other uh, traumatic event or something within the testicle, although, you know, um, there was no history of that in, in the clinical history in this particular um, data set. Um, or is it a, a more global systematic thing? And I think there certainly is some signal for it, um, but um, more experiments will, will need to take place to kind of uh, answer that uh, from a big picture perspective. But I think that's certainly a plausibility. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Van Atzel, back to you. Um, and we had a question uh, come in about the transcriptome analysis that you um, showed and where you talked about the identification of several genes, um, which you mentioned were ID genes that might coordinate quiescence versus self-renewal. Are you planning to follow up on those genes and their function? And, and how would you do that? Yes, that's one of the pathways that we think are really interesting, especially because of their uh, how, how it's located in, in this cluster zero all the way at the edge uh, and the co-expression. So uh, we know that uh, like um, factors such as BMP4 can induce expression of, of the ID gene. So that's a natural candidate in our pathway modification screen of postnatal CD34 positive cells. And then um, I mentioned that we're uh, planning on the uh, spatial transcriptomic profiling of the human fetal liver hempoetic stem cell niche. So potentially We'll get some more insight into like the specific factors available in the niche that can activate these pathways and then we can get to play around with those right um and there was also a question about um the the example that you showed of um using hscs to help people who have sickle cell um, disease are you mm -hmm. planning to to um, apply some of the findings from your work to try and see if you can um, improve HSC um, efficiency in mice with sickle cell phenotypes? Uh, well, I hope that um, what we showed in our work is just adding to the body of evidence that EPCR or CD201 could be a great marker and that there's some value in uh, further enriching for these cells. Um, so I hope people <laughs> will follow up on that, yes. Uh, I'm happy to contribute in any possible way. And in terms of uh, the question about uh, transplantation of HSCs into mice with a sickle cell phenotype, um, yes, I think this could improve uh, the efficiency of a process like that. If you specifically transfer cells that you know are capable of long-term multilineage engraftment, uh, assuming that these mice are immunocompromised and able to receive human cells. Thank you. Um, then there was a question, um, more of a background question about fetal um, HSCs, because you mentioned that these are um, a transient developmental cell population. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a question about um, what happens to that population after development and, and how does it differ from postnatal HSCs besides the engraftment potential that you mentioned. Right, so I didn't really mention all of, of hemophilic development, which is super interesting in itself and quite complex, but basically, um, the process is as follows. So hematopoietic stem cells arise in inside the uh, the fetus in the AGM uh, region. So when they're first born, there's only a few hematopoietic stem cells. And they then travel uh, prenatally to the fetal liver, which is a site where they'll expand in number and, and make up a pool that we then can use for the remainder of our lives to uh, um, make up our blood system. And it's also clear that there's some kind of maturation going on because this is really the peak of their uh, functionality at this stage. So after the fetal liver stage and around birth, uh, these cells then further migrate to the bone marrow, which is their final home and niche. And then the bone marrow becomes receptive to uh, take in these cells and that will then be their 
So the niche changes, and this also leads to uh, hematopoietic stem cells showing subtle differences throughout development, depending on which hematopoietic stem cell source you're looking at. So this is super interesting. And in our work, we're just making taking advantage of the fact that the fetal liver is such a unique and highly engraftable uh, source. Thank you so much for that. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today's webinar. Um, if you still have any further questions that you would like to ask to our speakers, please do consider reaching out to them directly. And you can see their contact information on the screen at the moment. As a reminder, um, this webinar will be archived on the website of The Scientist, and we will send you an email notifying you when the on-demand webinar is available. I would like to thank everyone who took the time to join us today, and particularly those of you who shared your questions and comments. On behalf of The Scientist, of course, I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Skim Van Atzel and Ryan Flanagan, as well as our sponsors, 10X Genomics, BioLegend, Synthego, and Icro Biosystems. Thank you everyone for tuning in today and um, I hope to see you again for our next webinar. Have a wonderful day.